Good afternoon and welcome to this week's episode of Rachel Gaffney's Real Ireland. Um, in this week's episode, we're going to talk about St. Patrick. We are approaching St. Patrick's Day and of course, as usual, the internet and the TV and the magazines will be awash with, you know, green beer, Lucky Charms, uh, beads and all of the usual stuff that you see on St. Patrick's Day over here in the United States. But I thought it was only appropriate that we talk about St. Patrick, uh, the patron saint of Ireland. He is one of three patron saints, St. Patrick, St. Bridget and indeed St. Cullum Kill. Now, those saints are for another episode. Today, we're going to talk about the real St. Patrick. There are over 800 churches around the world named after St. Patrick. Uh, people associate him with the shamrock, banishing the snakes out of Ireland. Uh, would you associate the colour blue with Ireland and St. Patrick? Maybe, maybe not. But in this episode, we are going to dive a little deeper and learn a little bit more about St. Patrick. Who was he? Where did he come from? Why was he in Ireland? What impact did he leave? And um, we're going to end then with a little, uh, small little portion on some food in that region of Ireland. Um, I'm going to introduce you to a chef up there, Paul Cunningham. Uh, but before we do that, um, I thought maybe I would tell you who our guest is today. His name is Dr. Tim Campbell. And Tim is the director of the St. Patrick Centre in Downpatrick in County Down. Um, rather than me telling you about Tim and the St. Patrick Centre, why don't you watch this little short video for a couple of minutes and learn for yourself. Hello, my name is Dr. Tim Campbell. I'm the director of the St. Patrick Centre, which is the only permanent exhibition in the world about St. Patrick. We say that the story of Ireland begins in the writings of St. Patrick. So this is a wonderful place to come and discover the history and the culture of Ireland. How can you come to Ireland and not find out about St. Patrick? The cathedral behind the St. Patrick Centre is where St. Patrick is buried, the national grave of St. Patrick, St. Bridget and St. Colum Kill. Beside this medieval cathedral is the national grave of Ireland's patron saint. When Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland in 432, he came to Saul Church, which is another destination in St. Patrick's country here in Downpatrick. And it's there that St. Patrick founded the first church in Ireland, and it was there that he died on the 17th of March, which is now celebrated all over the world. I think this place is special to me because of the interesting and varied landscape. It's beautiful, it's cultural, it's historical, and there's a deep sense of the spiritual here. Many people, when they come, say that they're touched because this is a famous holy site. It's the most holy place in Ireland, but it's also a place where people feel that there is a close connection between heaven and earth. Wow, isn't that really beautiful? And I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Tim Campbell, who is connecting with us right now from Downpatrick in Northern Ireland. Tim, how are you? Hey, Rachel, I'm great. I'm, I'm looking forward to March. This is my big time of the year. <laughs> As I said to you when we were talking yesterday, I said, you know, um, nobody wants me 11 months of the year, but they want me in March. It's kind of like uh, for an Irish person, and especially for you, it's your Super Bowl. It's the equivalent to the American Super Bowl. This is it. This is your Super Bowl, Tim. 
Yeah, we, we keep telling people that St. Patrick, you can celebrate St. Patrick every day of the year in Ireland because obviously there is not just a festival, but it can be a destination as well. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And we're going to go straight into it right now. That was a beautiful video and it really kind of encapsulates um, everything that you guys are doing there. So let's start off really briefly. Can you tell people how, um, when did the St. Patrick's Centre open its doors? We're just about to celebrate our 20th anniversary um, and we were created here uh, really in the spirit of St. Patrick after the Good Friday Agreement. So peace came to the northern part of Ireland. We realized that only one in 10 people who came to the island 20 years ago, whenever they got to Dublin Airport, they took a right instead of taking a left, which would have taken them north. So uh, we were one of the signature projects to try to improve the tourism numbers to come to Northern Ireland. And of course, we have seen so many improvements over those years. Uh, you really have. And I'm going to piggyback on what you said. You and I met last year um, at a dinner party and we were sitting across the table from each other. And I, you were so interesting. I always said, I'm going to chat with Tim. I'm going to get Tim to come on this show. And I'm so glad you agreed to it. But I met you because I was up visiting for my third time, I'm proud to say, County Down. And each time I go there, I realise there is so much to see in this part of the world. But let's go back to St. Patrick and County Down, because when people think about St. Patrick, um, they associate him with um, Ireland, of course, the colour green, uh, St. Patrick's Day. But why Northern Ireland? Why County Down? Now, we do know, and maybe if you could touch on, we've got Croke Patrick and County Mayo. We've lots of sites around Ireland. We've got St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. We've got, you know, uh, the Rock of Cashel in Tipperary. Lots of sites, Loch Derg and Donegal, that are associated with and have links to St. Patrick for their own reasons. But why especially County Down? Uh, I know it's a big question, but if you wouldn't mind, kind of break it down a little bit for us, please. So Patrick came to Ireland twice during his lifetime that we know. Once he was trafficked as a slave, and when he was trafficked, he was a shepherd slave on Slave Mish or Slemish, um, which is near Ballymena, where Liam Neeson is from. He escaped, he goes home, and eventually when he becomes a cleric himself, he comes to bring Christianity to that part that he knew the most, which is here in the northern part of Ireland. So he came in a mission very specifically to the wildest and the woolliest part to bring Christianity to the place beyond which there was nothing, which was uh, Ireland. Um, I really love what you're doing here. And for, for most people, you know, growing up in school, for me, I wasn't really a fan of history. And I, now I realize how much I love history. And history really is just storytelling, isn't it? So you have people who don't teach history very well because it's all about dates and then you have people who teach history very well by telling a great story and one of the great stories you tell is the story of St. Patrick and you can do this by going to the centre but what I love is how you guys have come up with the St. Patrick's Way uh, Camino Way and Passport. Could you tell us about that and Alan Graham and then maybe we'll start uh, introducing people to the story of St. Patrick in a way that you guys have come up with that's very clever. So as you said, Rachel, the St. Patrick Centre is the only permanent exhibition in the world about St. Patrick. So we're a destination. You can come and learn the story of St. Patrick and what a fascinating story it is. Um, the first words that were ever written down in Ireland were the land of saints and scholars was written by St. Patrick. So the story of Ireland starts here, but beyond the story, there are all these other sites that are associated with St. Patrick that we thought were really central to the, to the whole thing. Archaeological sites, really, really important, but they've never been linked up before. So what we did was um, over the last, of course, we're all locked down. Um, most of our business had been through a lot of coach business, you know, hundreds and hundreds of coach tours. So, but because things slowed down, obviously, in the last 12 months, we decided that we'd have a look and extend St. Patrick's Way, a walking trail, the Camino of Ireland, and include a lot of the sites that are critically associated with St. Patrick. Now, um, I'm going to go there, or our, our viewers are going to go there. What do they, uh, what can they expect? So you're going to give them a lovely passport. We have an image of what you're going to receive. So you start in St. Patrick's Centre and you get this passport. It's that green one that you've got there in your hand. Ah, there it is. Okay. And basically you get it stamped. Is that correct? You get it. 
Yep, yeah, you get a stamp like like in the original, like in the Camino of Santiago de Compostela. So as you go along, you get you get different stamps. We have um, the people who helped us to create this yes. were two former Adoration Sisters, and uh, they have pulled everything together for us, and they, they act as guides. So they take you around all of these different sites. That's, and as you uh, say, we, we should mention them. So it's um, Martina, Martina Purdy. Mar Martina Purdy, who was the ex-BBC political correspondent she. in Northern Ireland. Uh, yes, she she became a, a, an adoration sister with Elaine Kelly, who was a, a barrister, uh, a legal person. Unfortunately, the, the convent closed. They came to Downpatrick and um, I employed them to do some marketing work. Then lockdown came and they created this Camino and uh, people have been wanting to get out, you know, to get out, to walk, to be healthy, to do a little exercise. And it has really, really taken off. And so these two ladies are, are personalities in themselves, aren't they, from what I have heard? They are absolutely personalities. I mean, they get fan mail. They get fan mail before they arrived. <laughs> um, they do just every celebrity that there is to know. People want to come to be with them. So I think part of the experience is yeah. spending, a, I call it a slowcation. They call it a prayercation, where you can come. You don't necessarily have to be very religious, but there is a yeah. spiritual element, this idea of slowing down, getting close to nature, listening to their story. That's fantastic. So I just, I felt we had to mention them. So uh, going into the passport, there are how many holy sites along the way? Seven, six? There are seven sites uh, along the way. Okay. Yes, and you can do it in, um, you do it as a half day or you can do it as a full day. And the half day is uh, seven miles. And uh, in the half day, you take in uh, the sleeve. Uh, well, you take in a number of different sites. One of the most important that you take in as you go along um, is Inch Abbey, where the legend of the snakes was written. So we start uh, so though at the Downpatrick Centre, is that correct? You, you start right, there? You start at the St. Patrick Centre, yes, you do. You okay. see, start at the St. Patrick Centre, see our big IMAX audiovisual presentation, then go to Inch Abbey, which has become more famous in recent years because it's the site of the Game of Thrones has been filmed there. But it's a Cistercian Abbey from the 1100s, and it's there that... Um, the story of St. Patrick was written. So we start there and then we, we go along the Coyle Pondage. The Coyle is the original river that Patrick would have came into Ireland on okay. um, and very beautiful walk. And then we go to Saul Church. Saul Church, Saul in, in Irish means Sabla's barn. And it's in a barn that Patrick created his first church in 432 AD. And it's a very, very beautiful site, no bigger than most people's garage. And in it, um, he is also traditionally supposed to have died on the 17th of March. So it's one of these famous thin places where heaven and earth are close together. So we have many people going there. And, so this um, is Seoul Church and that's the third stop along the way. I think we have a photograph or an image that we want to share with people yep. of uh, Seoul Church. Um, can we show that, Ashley, there? Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. And look at look at the surroundings. You need to take a moment just to take in... Actually, this looks like I'm guessing my my detective work that this might have been taken this photograph in May or June because that looks like uh, elderflower, wild elderflower growing there in the foreground. But yes. um, it's beautiful, so you can actually go inside Soul Church or just around it. Never closes apart from at night time. So yes, really? that you can always get into and as I say it's one of these famous thin places we've had all sorts of cardinals and archbishops coming and, and priests and regular people and sometimes people just show up and just they break down in tears and, mm -hmm. it, and it's not always because I'm addressing them you know <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's funny I do remember our conversations at the dinner table you were very funny then too as well you're memorable could we go back to Inch Abbey for a moment um, you said the story of St. Patrick was written down there but isn't there another famous story associated with, uh, can we tell people about the snakes? Is this where it happened? The story of the snakes? Yes. Yeah. So the story of pa Patrick banishing the snakes from Ireland, of course, Patrick didn't banish the snakes. If you ever see Patrick as a statue, he's standing on a snake. And we always mm -hmm. think of snakes, rocks and green beer. But yeah. he didn't ban snakes from Ireland. Snakes were, had long gone after the last ice age. They, they disappeared. So right. Patrick... Um, Patrick didn't banish the snakes, but the legend of Patrick banishing the snakes was written down and it was written by a monk called Jocelyn of Barrow and Furness Abbey. And that abbey, Inch Abbey, which is in Downpatrick. 
And Beautiful. was that, but the snakes were really, it was symbolism, wasn't it? Maybe sort of banning paganism and introducing Christianity? It's exactly that. Think of snakes, the, that old great serpent of revelation. Snakes yeah. always get a bad press. And we, we're the only two land masses in the world, major land masses that do not have snakes occurring naturally. One of them is Ireland. The other one is New Zealand. Well, I live in Texas and trust me, I've seen a few of them and um, I'm not a fan. I'm not well, the greatest we, we, fan. We know nothing about them. <laughs> oh, you're better off. So we've gone from Inch Abbey and then we made our way to Soul Church. Um, and by the way, we, I, I would like to say uh, throughout this, so the entire walk, if you were to do all seven, would be, is this the 17 mile walk or no? It's the 17 mile walk. So you can do it as a half day or mm -hmm. some, some people come and stay over and they do it in two days, you see. So okay. we provide transfers and lunch. So you can break it down. So we've gone from Inch Abbey and then we made our way to Soul Church. Where do we go after Soul Church? So Soul Church, now I should say that some, you may choose one of our tours also does a Camino and Canoe because it was so popular last year, we decided that we would go on to the water. So you can paddle your way uh, to Inch Abbey um, as well as walk. But from Inch Abbey, then uh, we go to Soul Church. We have lunch in a beautiful little uh, wayside tavern called uh, The Barn at Saul. And then we walk from there to the tallest statue of St. Patrick in the world, uh, which is called Slave Patrick. And that's about a mile further on. And oh, we walk to the top of that, yeah. And whenever that was created, it's like uh, Christ the Redeemer uh, yeah. or Irish version of that. It's the tallest statue of St. Patrick in the world. When it was created of mourn granite, really, really hard stone, they decided that they were going to, well, they weren't quite sure how to make him look. Should they make him look like the Presbyterian man or the Methodist man or the or the Roman Catholic man or the Episcopalian? So what they decided to do, but they would dress him in the robes of the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Armagh, but they carved him with the robes, they carved him with the face of the, um, the, the Protestant Bishop of Dublin, who became the leader of the Episcopalian Church here in Ireland. So both traditions are are celebrated in the tallest statue. Oh, that's really nice. And you said Morn granite. So granite obviously comes from Morn. You have a lot of granite there. I didn't know that in the Morn Mountains. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard stuff. Uh, and you get beautiful views. Talking to the Morn Mountains, you get to see the Morn Mountains. And because it's St. Patrick's country, the local people call it St. Patrick's country, the tallest of the Morn Mountains uh, and the hotel that I believe you stayed in, Sleeve Donard, Sleeve in Irish meaning mountain. Donard was one of Patrick's missionaries. So it's hard to get away from Patrick. He's, That's uh, right. He's everywhere. Uh, yeah, because, so Donard was uh, the son of a chieftain, wasn't he? He was fascinated by Patrick and he was one of his first disciples, actually, uh, Donard. Really? And, and the son of a chieftain. He's buried, like many of our chieftains, buried on the top of the of the mountain underneath a huge cairn or a, a many, many rocks, a, a pyramid of, of boulders. So, and we still have a little oratory up at the top of that where the monks would have gone up to celebrate Patrick and Sleeve Donard, and it's the tallest mountain in the northern part of Ireland. So for anybody out there who's interested in doing a little climbing, it's quite easy to do. Yeah. And beautiful, beautiful views. It is. And to put it into perspective for people, um, I have a lot of clients that go over to play golf in Ireland, of course, and the famous, world famous golf course is Royal County Down. Um, you know, just normally on people's bucket list when you list courses around the world. So you would stay at the um, the Sleeve Donard Hotel and literally walk out the back of the Sleeve Donard and into Royal County Down Golf Course. Um, you're on the beach there on that beautiful coastal and then you're looking over at Sleeve Donard Mountain. So, you know, this is all kind of, we're, we're getting back to all the reasons why you want to go to this part of the world. And there are many more, trust me, we haven't even touched on them yet, you know, from uh, cycling and Art Glass Golf Club to other things. But I want to kind of go back onto the passport and um, stay on track here a little bit because I have a habit of wandering off myself. So we've come from, where are we now? We've come from Sleeve Patrick. Where's the next stop along the passport? So you've had your lunch. You've gone up to the top of Sleeve Patrick. We walk the beautiful Lakeel Way. We call it the Way of Tranquility. It's off-road, beautiful for about three miles. Uh, nothing but beautiful fields and forests and, and old ancient byways. Then you come to um, Strul Wells. Strul in Irish means sweet stream. And those are the earliest healing wells in Ireland with the unique bathhouse where Patrick himself is supposed to have bathed. It's a little bit like, I don't know if you remember she, Ursula Andrus back in the day when she used to see her, she, she would go down into the water and it was the secret for eternal youth. It's, it's a wee bit like that. Local people call it St. Patrick's Oh, tub. do you mean Ursula Andrus that used to be, was she a Bond girl or something? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So as soon as I tell, of course, I, I tell our, our visitors about, uh, you know, the secret for eternal youth, everybody wants to jump into the water, but we have to, we have to try and keep them out. Okay, you so have water to tell comes, people the story. Come on, tell them the funny story you told me about back uh, in the day well, yeah. with the wells. Back in the day with the, 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 the wells are famous for being triple distilled holy water, which is really, really unusual. Uh, so in the summer solstice, about 10,000 people would have come to these wells and they would have created almost a town in itself all the way around the wells. And they, um, whenever it came to midnight, there was a surge in the water and we're not sure whether it was a holy surge or somebody was holding the water back and then it surged through and it cascades through a series of little healing wells and into this big tub and uh, people used to frolic about um, semi-naked I have to say and there was such jocularity going on because they believed that you could not commit a sin at that one particular time so all these people were having you know a, a very serious early Woodstock going on in there. And uh, by the by the 19th century, so the middle of the 1800s, the, the local people decided that it wasn't a terribly good idea. Uh, although people would come here from as far away as Galway barefoot to come to the wells. Wow. So, um, but the, the local bishop decided he would ply it up because he didn't want people to keep coming. Um, and, but people still come, they still yeah. come. Uh, Hopefully not doing know, the same the, thing. <laughs> I think, well, not, as, <laughs> not on our know. tour. <laughs> Not an order. Order. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll move this on because this is the PG version today. Um, but after the Holy Wells, uh, where do you go after that? Where's next stop on the passport, Tim? Well, Holy Wells, then we come back into Down Patrick. We go to uh, the Roman Catholic St. Patrick's to see the only mosaic shrine of St. Patrick in Ireland. Is this and in then the St. Patrick's Cathedral? That that is no, that's in the Roman Catholic Church, which is St. Patrick's Roman Catholic. Okay. Um, and then then you go to the medieval cathedral, which was built in the eleven eighties by Jean de Courcy and his Norman knights. And mm -hmm. the Cistercian monks came here from back in France and they built that. And of course, St. Patrick is buried right beside. And you'd mentioned at the, at the start of the program about three saints that we traditionally have three saints buried, two with St. Patrick. So we've got St. Patrick, St. Bridget, and St. Colum Kill. And the, the medieval rhyme is in down one grave, three saints do fill, Patrick, Bridget, and Colum Kill. So the three apostles of Ireland are all buried here. It was big business for early pilgrimages. Okay. So there you have the passport. And I think we'd be remiss not to, to talk about a few um, little fun points and facts. Um, I don't know if you've noticed what color I'm wearing today. So you're wearing the national colour of Ireland? Yes. And I tell people that, that that's our national colour of Ireland. And they're like, no, it's not. It's green. I'm like, no, it's actually blue. Um, and I know that part of it is the reformation of the, you know, when King when Henry VIII was king of Ireland and he had left the the Catholic Church. And then we had a flag with a, with a harp with the blue background on it. That's where the blue came from. But there are other story. There are other associations with the blue. Could you tell us about those, please? Well, uh, I mean, a lot of people think, as you say, it's green, but the green is a more recent thing. Uh, medieval uh, times, uh, St. Patrick and his colour was was blue. St. Patrick's, uh, the order, ancient order of uh, of St. Patrick um, is was blue. Mm -hmm. uh, there may have been another colour before that that we don't know about, but certainly whenever it was endorsed into medieval arms, yes. the, the colour of our, the president of Ireland's flag is blue. That's right, green comes outside. a little bit yeah. Sorry, Green I didn't mean to interrupt with the time difference. Sometimes I sound like I'm interrupting you and I'm not. It's the lag sometimes. Yeah, green tends to be the emigrants view looking back. We get so many people coming from you know, the drier parts, particularly of America, and they, they talk about the 40 shades of green. And 40 yeah. shades of green is some, a song that was only written a few years ago. It's, it's yeah. not ancient, yeah. but the blue colour is ancient. So we're not trying to, um, you know, be buzzkills here or kill anybody's fun and love of green, but this is the official colour. And actually that that's funny enough, the colour I chose for my company when I started all those years ago. And that's the story behind the blue on my logo. Um, the shamrock, I really need to talk about the shamrock. People, every time, you know, I've been living here 20 plus years in the United States and so many people use the four leaf clover by mistake, but we are looking at the shamrock, which is actually three leaves. Could you just really briefly explain, Tim, uh, the symbolism behind the three-leaf shamrock with St. Patrick? Okay. 
If you ever see a statue of St. Patrick, he's holding a shamrock in one hand, and that's supposed to represent how he uh, Christianized Ireland. Um, the Irish people, they believed in worshipping uh, vegetation, they worship trees and rivers, um, and he was trying to show them the Trinity. So the idea is that the shamrock was supposed to be him showing them the Trinity. Now I've got to say he doesn't write that down. He doesn't mention that anywhere. Yeah. But you can see that it, it would be something that they may well have picked up. They also worship things in threes. So again, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and and using a plant to demonstrate this may well have been something that he did. Um, I, I get asked all the time as well. I was visiting uh, Monaster Boyce in County Louth, um, and one of the one of the highest, if not the highest, I think Celtic Cross in Ireland. I took a photo of it. Um, it was beautiful with the sky in the background. But uh, I'd like people to see. Isn't it lovely? Um, actually, this was just one of the Celtic crosses in Mon in Monaster Boyce. But people ask me about the Celtic Cross. Can you explain to them what that what we're looking at? Why the cross and the circle? Well, it's it's almost unique to Ireland this the, this idea of having a cross and a circle in it. Different people say different things about it. Some people say it's a, it's a, a fudge between the the new religion Christianity and the old religion, which would have been worshiping the sun and the moon. Other people say, well, yeah, no, it's not that at all. It's actually uh, a structural thing because the the wings and the cross got so big that they needed a structure underneath them to hold them up. So that's why they created the round structure. And a more recent uh, idea is that it actually is a Roman idea where you have a laurel wreath. They're discovering these the, as they dig up Rome at the minute. There's a cross with a laurel wreath behind it, which venerates the cross, which creates almost a Celtic cross as well. So pick one. We don't really know. Okay. Um, now, I, I mentioned and you mentioned earlier on in the conversation about uh, places to stay and food. And I, I thought I would sort of round off and end up this segment a little bit on um, some experiences I had while I was staying there. Um, I did stay in the Schlieve Donard Hotel, as Tim mentioned, and I took a photograph of the hotel there um, overlooking the beach and it's right next to Royal County Down Golf Club. Um, it's a beautiful property there. Look at that. Um, so that's, if you're staying there behind you, behind that spire is Royal County Down Golf Club. Out front is the ocean, the sea. And then to the other side, um, as if I'm looking at it, is uh, Schlieve Donner, the mountain that we referred to. Um, but one of the experiences I had there was uh, the food. The food in Ireland is spectacular. The entire island of Ireland, you have not lived until you really experienced the food. Now, I would be remiss again in not mentioning um, Chef Paul Cunningham. I met Chef Paul P Cunningham when I was over there, Tim. And earlier in the day, I met you at the dinner that night, but out earlier in the day when it was raining all day long. I don't know if you recall that. All day long. Um, I had been digging potatoes with Mash Direct in the rain, in the mud. Good farm girl I was. And then in the afternoon, I was out with Chef Paul Cunningham and we were foraging for seaweed. Now, Chef Paul Cunningham has the most incredible restaurant right opposite the Sleeve Donard Hotel called Brunel's. Yes. Uh, Paul is of the ethos um, very much sustainable and foraging. Now, I am going to be doing a whole episode on foraging because it, re it requires a whole episode. It is just about picking stuff. But we took a little video footage of how Paul looks for things and what he does in his restaurant. So have we got it there? Um, Ashley, that little video. No, your restaurant. What's the name of your restaurant? It's Burnell's. Burnell's, Burnell's. in in Newcastle. In Newcastle, yeah. that's right opposite the Sleeve Donard Hotel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So when you are using this, what would you use this sea truffle for? Because it's not actually a truffle. No. But it's called a sea truffle because it smells and tastes like a truffle of the sea. It smells and tastes like a truffle of the sea. What would you use it for? So we, we would use it for infusions, but we'd try that and use it for seasons as well. Yeah. So it goes really well with pork. So if you're doing like a puff pork cracker, we would just season it at the end of sea truffle. And the contrast and flavours, it's amazing. So you take the skin, you fry that, it bubbles up. This mm -hmm. is dehydrated. Yeah. It's made into a powder and then you and season. season it with it. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. It's really, really good. There's so many things you can do with it. There you have it. So when you're out and about and when you can get back out again, Tim, you got to go visit uh, Paul at Brunel's restaurant. Um, here's a few images of some of his work. Look, this is what he produces in his little kitchen there in, they're just works of art as well. Uh, but he uses local ingredients and he forages all the time. So he uses shamrock, he uses seaweeds. 
see there we have the shamrock there um and i thought that was a these were just nice little uh, food images to round off and show, um, you know, what's happening in the area, uh, which is not what people expect, is it, when they look at Irish food, when you look at all the images that are out there of, well, we won't say, but that's actually what we eat. And those are the experiences we have over there. Isn't that correct? I think we're a lot more exotic than people think, you know, they think it's all called cannon and, you know, yeah. cabbage and, and corned mm. beef, which is, you know, which is nice in itself, but it, that's not the staple. Uh, no. And you're talking about whether somebody had asked me the other day, what's it like uh, in Ireland in the in the summertime? And, and the answer is, of course, the rain is warmer. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. OK, I'd never heard of that, but that's that's fantastic. And you know what? I can't believe it. But I mean, we've been chatting for over half an hour and uh, I could, of course, talk to you forever and listen to you forever. But um, we're going to have to end it there. Um, Tim, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Uh, for people watching this and they want to learn more, what we're going to do is we will be providing links to the St. Patrick's Centre. We'll be providing links to any upcoming events. Um, but I do urge people to go to your social media pages and it's the St. Patrick's Centre, not just St. Patrick's Centre. It's the St. Patrick's Centre. Your website is very comprehensive. It uh, takes you to all your social media platforms. Um, you work with Tourism Ireland. You work with different people and there's different events coming on that I know about with Irish dancing, Irish food. So I urge people to go to the St. Patrick's Centre um, website. We will be providing the link to this, to Sleeve Donard Hotel, to Brunel's and, and more. Um, and they'll be in the comment section um, after this all airs. So, Tim, thank you very much. I know you've got a hectic schedule ahead of you uh, with St. Patrick's Day. Um, and for people who don't know, do you speak Irish? Do you know what ha Happy St. Patrick's Day is in Irish? Do you know, I, I don't. I don't, but I can invite all your... your listeners and, and viewers to join us on St. Patrick's Day. We have a virtual St. Patrick's Day celebration. So we can you can learn about some Irish then. <laughs> okay. So I'll say it. So Lo Fela Podrick um, is St. happy St. Patrick's Day. And um, until next time, everybody, thanks for joining us. Bye, y'all.